Good afternoon and welcome to the February issue of the Lots of Helping Hands webinar series. My name is Brooks Kenny, and I'm delighted to have all of you joining us today. Our presenters today are, um, we're delighted to have Sherry Snelling, the CEO and of the Caregiving Club, who is going to be interviewing our very special guest, Sylvia Mackey, who um, I, I know you all are quite familiar with, and we are delighted to be hearing her story um, and more about her tips about how to prepare for a caregiving situation. So welcome, uh, Sherry and Sylvia. We're Thank so you. pleased that you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So our agenda, just moving right to it, we will be walking through, Sherry's actually going to be interviewing Sylvia. Um, you all may be familiar with um, the Alzheimer's Association's blog um, where Sherry interviewed Sylvia for an upcoming book that she is writing on uh, caregiving and celebrities. And so you can read um, more about that um, at that blog. And Sherry's going to be interviewing Sylvia today about her experience and ways to prepare for caring. And so we're really looking forward to hearing those remarks. Um, Sherry then will also be sharing tips with all of us on caregiving. And we'll wrap it up with just a few minutes explaining the last service which is a free service designed to help organize all of those people in your life who want to come together when uh, someone is experiencing a medical crisis, uh, caregiver exhaustion, caring for a spouse, caring for an elderly parent. So we will walk through just a few steps on how to get started with lots of helping hands. So Sherry, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to you um, and have you be the presenter here now and walk through um, your questions and dialogue with Sylvia. Terrific. Um, so hopefully everybody can see um, the screen. And again, welcome. And I'm just really thrilled because I get to interview Sylvia Mackey. And for those of you who don't know Sylvia, she has a really fantastic story to tell us today. Now, Sylvia is known affectionately as Mrs. 88, and that's because her husband, John Mackey, was a NFL football player with the Baltimore Colts, and his jersey number was 88, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about a plan that the NFL put together based on that jersey number, but John was also a Super Bowl champion and an inductee into the NFL Hall of Fame, and Sylvia was there with him from the very beginning, uh, from his days playing in college. And most importantly, and what we're going to focus on today, are the last 10 years of John's life where he battled frontotemporal dementia and all the challenges and really some great tips and solutions that Sylvia came up with in order to keep their life as normal and as happy as possible. So Sylvia, thank you for joining us and I'm just so thrilled to have you here. Thank you, Sherry. Absolutely thrilled to be here. Well, I'm going to have you start by really giving us a background on John, who, as we know, is really a legend in the NFL. So tell us a little bit about his career. Yes, thank you. Well, when he came to the Baltimore Colts from college, he had a great college career, also wearing number 88, and he was drafted number uh, two by the Baltimore Colts. He just wanted to be the best tight end that he could possibly be. He had no aspirations of the Hall of Fame. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't even thinking like that. We weren't thinking about awards and accolades. He wanted to be the greatest teammate. And fortunately, he had a wonderful coach, Hall of Fame uh, coach, Don Shula, who let him catch passes, as, he, as John Mackey would always say, forever in a day, go deep and go deep and catch the ball and score a touchdown. And then he also was fortunate enough to play under uh, Johnny Unitas, the greatest um, quarterback in the world, who agreed with John on all of the things that he should be doing to make him great. And John would work late after practice with John Unitas and Raymond Berry on tuning up his game to make sure he was the best. John always went the extra mile for everything. Um, and leading up to his career, of course, we were college sweethearts, and at that time, I became a person that I felt was his helpmate, even helping him with some of his college courses and um, helping him get through school, even though he was real smart and could have done it on his own, too. And then after he retired from professional football, right up until now, on looking back, I could say that there was 
one incident in every decade of his life, in his 30s, in his 40s, and his 50s, that later on stood out as making me think, gosh, was that part of the beginning of frontal temporal dementia? And as it escalated, uh, I, well, the bizarre behavior really started to escalate in his 50s. And then by the time he was 55, we began to be annoyed. And of course, he was diagnosed three months after his 60th uh, birthday with frontal temporal dementia. And believe it or not, that diagnosis was such a relief. Because the bizarre behavior that led us up to having him diagnosed was so baffling, it was so puzzling, that when we heard the words frontal temporal dementia, I didn't know exactly what it meant, but I went online and I, got, I gathered all the information that I possibly could. Because to me, information got me ready for preparation. And being prepared and knowing what to expect cut down on all of the frustration that could have come up that I wouldn't have understood. But I knew what was coming. Whether I liked it or not, I knew what was coming. And I wanted to be prepared for any and every event so that it would not be unexpected. Well, and Sylvia, I think, I think those points are really very poignant because obviously you were with John through his entire career. And one of the things that we talked about is that he had this fantastic career in the NFL, but then he went on to actually become the president, the first president of the NFL Players Association. And he continued to be a champion in that role as well. Yes, actually he started as a player rep uh, towards the end of his NFL career. And... Um, I noticed then the things that he did not like. For example, in 1969, Frank Buncombe of the San Diego Chargers passed away on September 14th, right at the beginning of the football season. John wanted to know right away, was his widow going to be paid for the rest of his contract or for at least the rest of the season? Well, when he brought that up at a meeting, they said, oh, no, we don't have to pay her. She's young. She'll get married again. This made John absolutely livid. I remember he came to the phone and he called me and he said, we can't have this. This just can't be true. So this can't happen. He did end up getting her paid for the rest of the season. And I knew then that John was an advocate for families and wives and other things that existed outside of football because the wives are the people who are standing behind their man dur during this grueling game where anything could happen. NFL players. Um, but, you know, Sylvia, tell us a little bit about, so John had this fantastic career in the NFL, yes. went on then to be a champion for NFL players as, as the president of the association, but you started to notice little things over the years and, and obviously some bigger things um, with the frontotemporal dementia. Tell us a little bit about what those things were that you were seeing. Okay. When I look back, I'm going to start even in his 30s. He was supposed to go uh, to Syracuse, uh, a Syracuse University event in Los Angeles, and present um, the Syracuse Alumni Award of the Year to one of our former colleagues. John had won the year before. And all of a sudden, after preparing for his speech and getting dressed and being ready to leave, for us to go to this event, he gets to the door and he turns around and says to me, I'm not going. Well, it wasn't like John Matthew not to show up. Now, keep in mind, he's only about 38 or 39. And he had a blank stare on his face that I saw later on in frontal temporal dementia. And there was nothing I could do to get him to go. And of course, they started calling and he had no emotion about the fact that they were calling and wondering where he was. Then it's in his 40s. His mom passed away, and I've never seen such a reaction. It, it was just so very uh, unfeeling and unemotional. Uh, I didn't even know what the phone call was about when, um, he, when he learned his mother passed away. One second later, another phone call came in, and I heard him say to a friend of his, hey, man, my mom just kicked over. That's how I knew she had died. And, I'm, and there again was that blank stare. Then... In his 50s, 
he started doing weird things. Like he played, he paid three hundred dollars for a yoga class. Went to one class, and I said, "Honey, when are you going back?" He said, "Oh, I've been to one class. I know how to do it. I don't have to go anymore." And then he stopped reading the newspaper. He stopped reading books, and he was an avid reader. Uh, he started repeating himself, and then one of the alarming things was he started concentrating on very petty things. He built a shelf for the bathroom that really was nothing to look at at all, and he just kept praising himself over this shelf that we thought was absolutely nothing, but we wanted to make him feel good, and we would say, oh, yes, honey, this is wonderful. And there was one thing after another. He even repossessed his Hall of Fame and Super Bowl rings and just wanted to walk around with $7,000 in his pocket that he got for these. Well, I actually had to take over the contract and go to the pawn uh, shop and buy them back. Things that were just, we didn't want to say to him, what are you doing this or make or put him down or make him feel bad about it. But they were just so strange and they just kept adding up and adding up. Well, and there were a couple really poignant stories that you told me, Sylvia, and one I'd love to have you share with our listeners mm -hmm. um, that I think really speaks to, you know, this, this whole idea that you told me. You said, you know, your message became prepare, prepare, prepare. Exactly. And there was an incident where uh, you were going through the airport, and I think people can see on the screen right now the wonderful cowboy hat that was John's kind of trademark. Yeah, and those NFL Super Bowl rings there. But yeah. tell us, tell us about that day at the airport and what happened, and then what you had to start doing so that you guys could continue to travel. Yes, thank you. I, you know, I could see. Uh, first of all, one of the important things in caregiving is to keep keep your loved one active in what they love to do. And I would always take John to the Hall of Fame and to the uh, Super Bowl. Well, this time he was going to an autograph show in uh, Kansas City, and previously I had seen John have more and more trouble going through airport security. He didn't want to take off that hat. He thought they were going to steal it. He didn't want to take off the rings. He thought he wouldn't see them on the other side. And uh, he would actually make up stories about other people whom he'd seen in the airport whose jewelry would be missing after it went through the scanner. Totally not true. We knew he was making this up. But this, it, it had escalated to the point where he looked at the scanning, uh, the, what do you call it, the archway that you walk through, the machine, and he ran through it as though he were playing in a football game. And I could see how TSA all lined up there in uniforms. That might have looked like what he was supposed to do. Here's the hole, now you run through it. Well, they tackled him, took four people to bring him down, knocked him to the ground, tied his hands up behind his back, and I'm screaming, please don't kill him, please don't kill him, because I know, being a flight attendant, that if he had really gotten away and run down the concourse, they have every right to shoot him. And I thought, this, it, it, this is just unbelievable. And because he was in Baltimore, and... Um, they knew who he was. They allowed him to be taken away from the airport in an ambulance to a hospital instead of taken to jail. And I began to think after that, is this it? Does this mean he can't travel or fly anymore? So the next year, we went to the Super Bowl on the train. We got a sleeping car, 24 hours on the train to Miami. But then the following year, the Super Bowl was in Phoenix. And I said, we can't take a three or four day train to Phoenix. There's got to be a way. Well, I called TSA, Transportation Security Administration. I found the name of the person who's the head of the uh, TSA in Baltimore, um, Mike Elliott, and I called him. And he worked with us just like you would not believe. He knew what day and time we were coming through the airport to go to the Super Bowl. He met us at uh, the door of the airport. He shut down a lane and let John Mackey have a very special screening, and John did not understand what was going on at all. Um, he also called ahead, knowing we had to get back from Phoenix to the transportation authorities there, who did it in a different way, which I totally understand, because they couldn't do it the same, because we already knew what was going to happen. 
and um, he might and the TSA there by being prepared two or three weeks in advance of our trip um, let me know that this kind of preparation can be done with anything that you want to do and especially with travel you can't get there with someone with Alzheimer's or dementia or other mental disabilities without having the proper authorities notified in time. That well, saves that. And what I love about this story, Sylvia, is that it is a couple of things. One yeah. is that you did not take this situation and and take it as a defeat. You said, yeah. okay, we're going to have to think of something else. We're going to have to come up with a plan because we love the Super Bowl. We love to travel to this game. So what do we do? How do we do that? And you took it upon yourself to, as you said, get together with the TSA agents. What I'd love for our listeners to know is that a lot of folks, and, and you have a, a, a certain amount of celebrity, with obviously with John's legendary playing at the NFL, but a lot of people think, well, of course, you know, celebrities are always given special treatment. But in fact, we know that in this instance, the TSA will work with anybody who has a loved one that has special needs, correct? Yeah. Yes, Mike wanted me to uh, make that point with anyone that I talk to. He said, always have them call me if they think there's going to be a problem going through airport security. So, and it's so a I would call Mike if I had a friend in Chicago and didn't know whom to talk to in Chicago because Mike knows whom my friend should call in Chicago to get her husband through airport security. So I think that's a great tip for our listeners because, again, you know, you do have to do a little research. You do have to kind of find out who those contacts are, but you don't have to give up things in your life that can be joyful or that can be helpful to your loved one. I mean, you told me that John loved doing these trips. He loved the excitement of being at the bowl games again, and so to give that up would have been very sad. Yeah, it would have been a disservice to him, really. Um, I, and I, like I said, I wanted him to enjoy everything until I absolutely knew he couldn't enjoy it anymore. Right. He, even if he didn't remember where he'd been after he got home, that was okay. I enjoyed the smile on his face, and the fans just always loved to see him. And he always signed every autograph. He loved signing autographs. He never turned anyone down. And this was a good opportunity for him to be in his element where people knew who he was and they'd be asking him for his autograph. Sure. Well, let's go to the next slide because, um, you know, this is, this is a terrific story of all the things that you've done, but it doesn't really end. And sadly, we know that John did pass away last summer um, and that you were, you know, you had been there for him for all those years of this progressive disease. The unfortunate thing with, that we know of dementia and Alzheimer's and what's toughest on the caregivers of those folks is how long the disease really can impact your life. But what I want to get to is, I put this title on here, Make Your Mess Your Message. I actually stole that from Robin Roberts of Good Morning oh, America. Oh, I like she, <laughs> I like it too. She used <laughs> that one morning and I thought, oh, that's perfect. And it really reminds me, Sylvia, of you because I'd love for you to tell our listeners about how you've really become a champion now for caregivers. Oh, thank you everywhere and and all the advocacy you're doing I mean you're doing wonderful things and let's start first though with the NFL 88 plan oh you took me right back to where I wanted to start okay <laughs> oh, hey. well from my wanting to take John to everything that he loved the Hall of Fame ceremonies those are just wonderful and we would drive to that but um, every year I took him back I would everybody knew that John had they didn't know Alzheimer's or dementia, but something was wrong. And other wives would be asking me questions. They would be saying, you know, Joe is acting this way and that way, and I, I'm thinking maybe he needs a diagnosis. And then after a while, there were wives who were bringing their husbands back who would say to me, you know, Pete has Alzheimer's or uh, Jim has uh, dementia. And I'm thinking, well, this is just the Hall of Fame, a small group of about, at that time, 264, there's still, I think, like only 300 now, 260-some men in the Hall of Fame, and I've had five or six wives ask me about Alzheimer's and dementia. Something is wrong with this picture. There is a common denominator here. And I'm saying, if there are these many in this group, how many other retired ball players are also uh, stricken with these diseases? So I wrote a letter to Paul Tagliabue, 
who was on his way out. It was his last uh, year as the commissioner. And I thought Paul had had a stellar and a great career, but I said, Paul, there's one more thing I would like for you to do, and that is to do something for this horribly horrific disease that I see so many of our NFL brothers have that I don't care whether it's caused by football or not. These diseases cause complete financial uh, devastation, and one can totally lose their dignity. How can we let that happen in the NFL and not do something about it? He said he showed my letter to his wife, and she cried. So Paul had a sensitivity about him, and I knew it because fortunately I had known him socially before on a limited basis, but I knew him, and I knew his wife, Jan. And he took my letter into the office, and it, when they called me, they said, we want to name a plan that we've come up with. We want to name this plan after John, the ADA plan. And John's teammates, who are here in Baltimore with Bruce Laird and our, our group called Fourth and Goal, have been pioneering for something to be done since 2004. 2003 or 2004, when they went to a players' convention in Las Vegas and brought up John's plight, they wanted to help us. So this all culminated after I wrote the letter. It came together uh, as the 88 plan because all of us stuck together and finally Paul Tagliabu took it to someone and said, this has to be addressed. And I am so proud of that plan. It's a benefit unique to the NFL because it is a benefit and it's not based on financial need. Well, and I think I think it's you know again, it's a great example of an organization that has acknowledged, you know, that there is a need out there and it, and of course it does provide financial uh, assistance to those families who have um, the retired players who have dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's or ALS, correct? That's right. And, you know, you talked about how many families were really impacted by the plan, Sylvia. And one of the things I think is important for our listeners to remember, you know, John played in the 60s and, and the early 70s. And back then, the football players didn't make the big million-dollar contracts that they have today. In fact, you know, I think I read, and you told me, over the course of his 10-year career, John made about $500,000. Well, you know, a backup player in the NFL, somebody who's sitting on the bench most of the time, that's what they make in one season. So financially, a lot of the families who are now encountering dementia and other diseases, I mean, they don't have the financial resources, right? Exactly. Um, it's just because the disease is so unpredictable and the amount of money of the, for the cost of care, when you consider that eventually they will have to be placed in a facility that's going to charge probably at least a hundred thousand dollars a year the average family cannot come up or above average family can't even come up with that kind of money that it takes to care and the medication and the doctors and the tests are, are just phenomenal it can totally devastate one's whole life what they've saved for and worked for their entire life well, and you did say, I mean, we know that, that John's, at the very end, his care required him to be in a memory care facility yes. and a memory care center, and you said that 88 plan saved you. Absolutely. I shudder to think of where I would be without it. I feel just so fortunate, and even more fortunate, because it was able to uh, affect so many families. I, the last count we took, there were... Um, at least 165 uh, ball players in the plan. So can you imagine just the ripple effect? One, for example, um, one of my friend's granddaughters who had been taking care of her grandfather who had dementia after the 88 plan come, came in, she was able to realize her dream to go to graduate school because now she, he, not only was he taken care of with the, with the resources that they have, their own earnings, she could now go to graduate school, not only for the time, but also she had the finances to be able to go to graduate school. Not, I'm not to say that the fund provides that, no, but the fund paid for his care. So therefore, their family money was their family money. 
Right. Yeah. Well, and and Sylvia, so um, you know, I know that you're still obviously a, an advocate, even though the 88 plan is now in in place. Yeah. You're still an advocate for the retired players, families, and caregivers, and you're also on the board, of the Association of the Frontotemporal Degeneration. So tell us a little bit about what you've been doing with the organizations. Well, the um, Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration promotes and funds research into the finding and the causes and cures for frontal temporal dementia. And this is very important because we hope one day maybe no one will need the ADA plan. So we provide information, education, and support to the people with FTD and for the families and the caregivers. It's so important that we concentrate on uh, the families and the caregivers because 43% of caregivers die before the patient does because it's such a grueling task. It's, and we don't look at it as grueling. We just look at it as something we want to do because we love the person that we're taking care of. And it's something that, not only, as I said, not only that we have to do, but that we love to do. And right. Well, you know, and that's, that's a great segue, actually, Sylvia, um, okay. because it's, it's a great message in that, you're providing this fantastic care for your loved one, but you also have to balance caring for yourself. And that's obviously a big message that we all have. And what I loved when I talked with you is you told me a little bit about your family, your children, and, and we see on the, on the screen now your gorgeous grandson, but you also talked about your, your love of dancing. So tell us about how you find your me time. <laughs> okay. Part of my me time is that uh, I'm, working as a flight attendant for United Airlines. That started in 1998, um, which is late for most, but that was just fine for me. I love my job. I'm fortunate that I love my job. It gives me good away time, good thinking time, but I also had the support of the ADA plan to care for John while I was gone. And before that, I had the support of my beautiful daughter here on the screen who moved from California to Baltimore to help me with John while I was continuing to go to work because her job uh, allowed her to transfer to the uh, Neiman Marcus in Washington, D.C. Until one day, as John became uh, more and more debilitated, she realized she had to quit and be here with him all the time. But as a result of her moving to Baltimore, she also met her husband here and uh, hence that beautiful grandson that we see he in the, here in the picture. They provided so much joy for John. And John knew Laura just, uh, we, uh, we know, all the way until the end. And the grandson is named John Mackie Nattens, and Laura would take him to the memory care facility, and he would get such joy out of just seeing him. He wasn't walking then, but John, he, it, like when John looked at little John Mackey Natten, he got he had a smile on his face that said, "That's my grandson," even though he couldn't say it. And the satisfaction that that brought for all of us was just beyond belief. Now, Laura, I've never asked Laura to come here. She sensed it. She knew it. She loves her father, and my other two children love their father equally, but they all had a different kind of input. And everybody can't do the same thing. My daughter Lisa started the John Mackey Fund, Inc. to raise money that we donate to the Association for Frontal Temporal De Degenerations for research. And I'm also on their board of directors, by the way. I'm also on the board of directors of the Alzheimer's Association of Maryland, and we've donated money to that organization, too, because of the John Mackey Fund, Inc., 5013C. So, We've all sort of, as we say, come full circle. My son, Kevin, lives in Atlanta, Georgia, but the support and the phone calls that he was able to give and the visits mean just as much as what the other two contributed to. Um, so we have no resentment about no one, not, uh, any of the children not doing enough. We all did, I understood everybody's point. My daughter, Lisa, who started the John Mackey Fund, it hurt her so much to see her father in that condition. So she tried to do what she could from her end, even though she did come to visit. 
but my daughter Laura was there hands on every day. Well, and I think I think that's a great message again for for listeners because, you know, family members can take on different roles. It's right. not it's not everybody that needs to provide that hands on care. Maybe somebody knows the law a little bit better, or they want to do the paperwork, or whatever it is. But you're right. Your your family came together, and everybody took on a role. Exactly which is great. Now, I, I want to go back to your dancing, and so you've <laughs> talked about how you love being a flight attendant for United, and then you also, you've taken time for yourself to do dancing. I think it's important that, that our listeners know that you, you didn't have any guilt over being able to do the things that you still needed to do to keep Sylvia going. No. I, well, I've always been a dancer, and I just love to dance, so I don't believe in letting adversity shut one's passion for joy and the things that they like to do. I don't believe in letting that shut them down. So I just continue with, you know, nice party comes up or there's a nice nightclub to go to to dance with with friends. I will go. But fortunately, you know, I had Laura here. And, of course, then Laura and I would go out together a lot also. And we have the ADA plan where we had where we were able to pay someone to come in and be with John. And then before that, we would take him with us. As long as he could go, we would take him along. So I try, and I like to travel also, even if I'm not working. I like to, um, I went to Paris on vacation just because I could and because I wanted to. And I was fortunate to be able to do that and to do it that easily, not only because I worked for the airline, but also because I had a sense of self-preservation about myself that I didn't want to stop. I wanted that just to keep going. Well, and that, that it's hard. I've talked to so many caregivers, and as we know, you often start to neglect your own needs, and right. then you spiral down, and that's how the health, you know, as you said, they get uh, they become more ill, the caregivers, than the person they're caring for. So. Right. I love your message. I love your message about taking care of you as much as you're taking care of that person you love so much. Thank you. Yes. Then also, I enjoy helping other people. Like I'm, in, I'm enjoying this webinar. I'm hoping that um, some of my message reaches out to make somebody who might have been down this morning, maybe they'll be up this afternoon after they've heard something that I've said. That's what I'm hoping for. And also, uh, I enjoy carrying the message. Uh, I was approached by the NFL and the Morehouse School of Medicine to join their community huddle. We go to NFL cities, of which we've already done 15, and we deliver a message about taking a goal line stand for your mind and body. And my part is to explain how I dealt with John because his condition is also a mental condition. And we want to help people reduce the stigma while influencing supportive measures to address all mental health disorders. Because there is a stigma about certain mental disabilities. Because I've met, I've met many people who are caring for someone with Alzheimer's and dementia who go through a long denial period before they realize you can't fight it. You're, this person is not the same person that they were. You're now dealing with a disease. Mm -hmm. You have to move past what you expected of John or Mary. You're now dealing with a part of the brain that's been altered to make this physical body perform in a different manner that's mm -hmm. not pleasing to you and maybe not to the people around you. But you've got to face it. And the sooner you face it, the better off the caregiver is. That's why I said that, believe it or not, his diagnosis was a relief. Mm -hmm. It was like sand going through a sieve. It was like, okay, cool down. There's no point in being angry. That's wasted energy. Learn what you can about what is coming up. I also learned that anything that was uh, that the NFL said was a great influence on John, and I could use that even in dementia. And I'm going to use one example that I hear a lot of people talking about. In these diseases, 
incontinence is something that's going to happen. You don't want it to, and I see too many people waiting until it does happen, and then they become frustrated with, with that person. Well, with John, I went out and bought the necessary adult underwear before he needed it, while he could still understand what the NFL meant. And I brought the package home, and I said, honey, look what the NFL sent. And he opened the package, and I said, yes, adult underwear for um, retired players. He said, can I try them on? I said, yeah. He tried them on. He walked over to the mirror. He patted his stomach in the front and turned to the side, and he said, hey, these are nice. So when it happened, he was prepared, and he wasn't looking at it as anything negative. He, I, took, I took that lesson to apply the NFL. Uh, the NFL's influence to even making him take a shower. I said it was NFL shower day. That got him into the shower. Because, you know, with people with dementia and Alzheimer's, personal, uh, personal hygiene becomes a problem down the road. And I knew that was coming. So mm -hmm. we started off with, the, with it being an NFL shower day to make him enjoy it instead of running from it. Well, and again, I think, Sylvia, these are these are such great solutions. You know, a lot of people might say, oh, that's so tough, you know, but you're right. The, the disease of dementia or Alzheimer's changes that person that you knew, yes. and therefore you have to change then how you approach it. And I think some of your creativity in understanding, first of all, you knew what was going to motivate your husband, and right. you, you came up with the right tools. That's a good that, way to do it. Yeah, that not that not only helped him, but it helped you too. You know, exactly. it, it helped you. So I think, and and that's a nice segue to the next slide, which is we want to talk a little bit about some tips for those out there, uh, our listeners who are caring for a spouse. We know that not everybody who's listening today might be caring for someone with dementia or Alzheimer's, uh -huh. but I do want to mention that the Alzheimer's Association has developed the ten early warning signs of the disease, and you can find that on their website. And, you know, it's so important, as you said, to not live in denial, but to understand what the signs of the disease are. And if, in fact, your loved one has that, those signs, you can start to plan ahead. You can start to come up with these, these preparations like Sylvia, like you have. So that's a, that's a really nice segue. I'm going to go yeah. through this pretty quickly because I know we got started a little bit late, but I wanted to, in honor of Sylvia and John and the 88 plan, I told Sylvia this morning, I can't possibly get through 88 tips, but maybe I can do eight for people. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the first one here, when I, when I interviewed Sylvia last fall for my book, uh, can we go back to the earlier slide? I just want to show that. Uh, I, I said to her, I said, you know, Sylvia, you, you are a woman warrior. You're one of my uh, caregiving heroes. And I think what she has just told us in her wonderful story is that there are two things that you face as a caregiver. One is you, you have to try to develop patience. And the second thing is you just know that over time you will create that new normal. You will be able to figure it out and you will be able to soldier on. So those are kind of our messages today. So the next slide is talking about that guilt. And you know, Sylvia, your your story about the incontinence was terrific because I think okay. the one emotion I hear and the one thing I hear from caregivers everywhere is that they do have a lot of guilt. To, you know, guilt that they're not giving enough to their loved one, guilt that they're not giving enough to their job, guilt that they're not giving enough to their children. Mm -hmm. And the, the bottom line is when you're a caregiver, you just have to embrace it. Yes, there will be guilt. I mean, we all have some kind of guilt in our life, but how do, how do you overcome it? And, you know, I think your story was great. You know, you said, I didn't feel guilty about working because it's what John wanted you to do, right? Yes, yes. So I think, I think that's a really important message. The second tip is don't let fear isolate you. You know, if a loved one gets a devastating diagnosis, whether it's cancer or Alzheimer's, uh, you can want to just shut down and you can want to just kind of, you know, stay in bed all day um, or whatever, but you have to reach out. You have to understand that um, not going it alone is really critical to your health and wellness, and there are a lot of ways to reach out and get help. So the next slide really talks about what I call finding your vault. 
And you know, this is this is something that came out of an interview that I did with a caregiver where she talked about her vault. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, well, my vault is my best friend. And my best friend is somebody that I know that I can I can vent, I can melt down, I can scream, I can yell, I can cry, I can tell her anything, and I know it's safe and secure, it's going in the vault. And she's not going to judge me, and she's not going to throw it back in my face later, but she's going to just let me, you know, get this out, and then she's going to give me a hug afterwards. And I thought, I really like that. So one of the tips is find your vault. Mm -hmm. The next slide is, okay, so you, you may find your vault, and that's great, but, but perhaps that friend or spouse or sister, whoever your vault is, they may not be going through the exact same thing you're going through. So it's really important to reach out for support. Support groups are terrific. Um, you know, whether your situation is Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's Association has a, a wonderful um, connection to different support groups. Uh, if you're caring for a veteran, there's the Wounded Warrior Project, and they have a lot of support for caregivers. Or if you're caring for a spouse who has cancer, Well Spouse is another great organization. But whatever it is, reach out and find that support group so you can be with people who know exactly what you're feeling. They get it. And, and in fact, they can come up with some great tips for you. Um, because they are going through the same thing, they might come up with something that really helps you. And the second thing is also reach out to your employer. If you happen to be one of the 73% of caregivers who are working today, there are a lot of employers out there who do have uh, services and programs that can help you and um, help you with research, help with coordinating the community and, and home-based services that you might need. So reaching out is really critical. The next slide is uh, a, a couple of different tips actually. One is you really have to become a journalist or if you want to use a different term you have to become a detective and when you become a caregiver you have to start to ask a lot of questions. There's going to be a lot of unknowns and you really have to start to sift through the information and see you know get the get the answers that you feel comfortable that you need. You also have to be an advocate. Um, you know a lot of healthcare professionals uh, talk in language that a lot of us don't really understand <laughs> and it's tough you might feel intimidated about asking a question or they may dismiss you but you are a critical part of the primary care team and you need to be that advocate for your loved one and for yourself and for your family and the third thing is you have to become a great record keeper um, I, I usually am not great at filing, but I am good at keeping records. And, you know, it's really critical that you have the record of your loved ones, you know, the medications, the doctor visits, whatever it is. Um, it's really important. And there's a great uh, tool from Microsoft called the Microsoft Health Vault. And it's recommended by the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Association, Walgreens, and the Mayo Clinic, and others. And it's it's a great free online tool where you can put in your information, and then it's there and it's secure. Um, as Sylvia told us, the next slide <clears throat> is you know prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, caregiving is going to mean that things will change in your life. And while it's hard to know what the you know what that that preparation might need, you don't know that it might be cancer, you don't know that it might be Alzheimer's, you can do a couple of things now. And I really encourage caregivers to have that conversation with their loved one. Understand what their wishes are should it come to end of life situations. Understand what insurance there might be. Is there long-term care insurance? Are there plans like, in Sylvia's case, the 88 plan that you'll be able to tap into so that you know you're not going to financially bankrupt yourself and your family? Whatever you can do to prepare and plan ahead now is going to save you in the long run. The next one is, the next slide is, is again, creating that new normal. I think Sylvia just gave you a great example of she and John wanted to continue to travel. So she had to come up with a new plan. She wasn't going to stop traveling, so what did she need to do to keep that going? And, you know, there's a lot of wonderful resources out there. Sometimes you don't know where to start or what can help. Uh, two places that I would recommend, one is AARP, their website. They have a great caregiver resource center, which, which has a lot of really terrific information. 
and then also um, the Alzheimer's Association, specifically for today's story about dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, they also have terrific resources for caregivers um, that you should check out. But whatever your typical situation is, um, you know, whether it's the disease organization of the diagnosis of your loved one or ARP has a lot of very good general caregiving information, I encourage you to go there and, and help you create that new normal. And then my, my eighth tip <clears throat> is to leave you with the thought of you just need to breathe. You need to find that way to escape. <clears throat> Sylvia found it through work. She found it through her love for dancing, as, as she told us. Uh, she found it through, you know, the comfort of her family. Um, but just taking that time for yourself. You know, Dr. Oz has uh, great tips on breathing. It's something we can all do. He says, you know, lie on your back, put one hand on your stomach and one hand on your chest. Inhale and count to five as you inhale and hold it for five seconds and then exhale slowly. And seriously, if you do that 10 times a day, it actually improves your health and wellness. It's amazing. And you know, we can all lie on the floor. Sometimes I get down there and I feel like I don't know if I want to get back up, but it's something you can do and it really does help clear your mind, uh, particularly if you're at that, that, uh, that point uh, where you're ready to blow. So find your, find your way to get your, breathe, your just breathe and, and find your escape. And then that brings us to balancing self-care while caregiving. Um, Sylvia is a great example of how to do that. <clears throat> and you've seen how she looks. I mean, she she's, looks fantastic. My God, she's absolutely gorgeous. Of course, she's a former model, so. <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> but Sylvia, you, you really are. You're a great example of how to take care of yourself and also provide the best care that you can to, to John and to, to your loved ones out there. Um, one thing that I found about this balance is there's a great organization called the Monday Campaigns, and they have um, tips, um, and they've created now the Caregivers Monday campaign, and I would encourage you to go to their website and check out the tips. I've worked with them, and I've come up with video tips I do now every week called the Me Time Monday videos, and it's all about how to find that balance between finding time for yourself while you're caregiving. And with that, I will leave you with these resources. I know these will be available after the website, um, but these are a lot of the organizations that I just mentioned in um, ways that can help. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sherry and Sylvia, for sharing these remarks with us today. It was so valuable, I know, to everyone in uh, who's participating. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and take control of the screen here and walk you through a few slides related to lots of helping hands. Um, lots of Helping Hands, actually, it's a perfect segue to many of the topics that um, Sylvia and Sherry both touched on. Certainly, we know that caregivers in our country manage so much um, their loved ones' care. They're often the primary source of communication to family members, and they're really the glue to their loved ones' social circles. And so our service is a free service that allows one to create private community websites that organize family and friends during times of need. We like to uh, talk about this phrase a lot here at Lots of Helping Hands. Um, we have almost a million people who have participated in our private communities. And one common theme that we hear over and over again is that caregivers are bombarded with that question what can I do to help? And those eager volunteers or friends, family members, church, synagogue members, neighbors, we often hear from them that they're so eager to help someone that uh, they care about when they're experiencing caregiving. And so Lots Helping Hands essentially was created to answer this question and to bring to together what we call someone's circles of community, those friends, the family members, neighbors, colleagues, uh, folks from their religious, your religious community who may see you caring for your spouse, may see you taking care of mom or dad. And while you may not perceive yourself or use the word caregiver, um, you're just you're just a, a daughter or a spouse or um, a a parent. You are overwhelmed, obviously, with all of those duties, and the people around you want to come together, and they want to do something, and they want to be able to help. And so our free service allows you to easily manage those daily tasks that can become a challenge, whether it's a medical crisis, caregiver exhaustion, or even dealing with an unexpected life event. 
uh, communities at Lots of Helping Hands, again, are free. Uh, they are private and secure, and essentially they are your own website that allows you to manage all of the offers of help that you get from well-meaning friends and family, and also share well wishes, uh, share photographs, really share in your life about your experience wherever you are in your caregiving journey. The hallmark of this service is our health calendar that allows uh, individuals to post volunteer tasks that are needed to help in a particular situation. So the coordinator of the community, the person who kind of organizes the organization, if you will, uh, they can easily post tasks on the coordination calendar. Members are those volunteers who are signing up and who are part of your community website. They can easily sign in and see that a family might need meals on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and perhaps rides to medical appointments on, on Thursday afternoons. The system then sends reminders um, on a regular basis to both the coordinator as well as the members in the community in order to keep everybody on task so everyone knows uh, what uh, what's happening in the community, who's doing what when, how to get where they need to go. There's links to Google Maps. Um, there's opportunities for customization if the family has a particular dietary restriction or particular needs. So it's, it's very intuitive. It was developed with the caregiver specifically in mind, um, and there's a lot of really interesting features that I invite you to explore. We also have a growing list of community building features that allow um, communities to come together uh, in sharing information and support. Members can post photos, announcements, use the message board, send well, wish, well wishes to the family, and share other information. And what's great about um, the community sections is members can really make it their own. So if a family has particular dietary restrictions or if the caregiver wants to have a, a personal blog, they can modify the sections within the community in order to share that with other members. And we see so many creative ways to use the community sections within, within the community websites. To create a community, again, the service is free. And um, if you go to lotsahelpinghands.com and simply click on the Create, it will take you to a form that takes about a minute to fill out. And we ask just a few questions to get help you get started. One of the very unique features of the service that we provide is we have partnerships with more than uh, 50 national nonprofit organizations across the country, and uh, several of them offer resources uh, to our communities. So if you are caring for someone um, with lung cancer, you can identify your community, for example, with the American Lung Association. And so you, your loved one, and those around you can benefit from additional resources and content information from these trusted groups. So I encourage you to go ahead and take a look um, at the resources that we provide within, within the communities as well. Once you've created a community, there, there are basically three steps. Uh, first is inviting people to join. All those folks who've offered the very well-meaning um, uh, comments about wanting to help you and, and wanting to get involved and assist you and make your load a little bit lighter as a caregiver, you can invite all of them to join the community. You can add the needs that you have to the calendar. And then you can continue to promote your community by sharing the URL, um, the web address, if you will, of the community through Facebook, through um, your other social media sites, uh, via email with your friends and family, anybody who wants to participate. I have to tell you, we have communities that are made up of you know, 25 to 30 people in some cases, and then we have communities that have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, depending upon the particular situation and the length of time that the community is in place to organize help for someone in need. We have many demos on our website at lotshelpinghands.com slash demo, so I encourage you, um, we obviously aren't going to go into a lot of tips today because that wasn't the focus of this particular webinar, but we do have previous recordings of webinars that I invite you to check out and learn about how uh, to do the various uh, functions within Lots of Helping Hands. And to that point, we have a member support center that is available 24-7 to members of our communities, as well as those who perhaps just want to learn more. So I know from the registration that many of you participating today 
are uh, not yet part of a community at Lots of Helping Hands. And so our member support folks, they can help you even if you're not in a community, if you just want more information about how to get started or if you're wondering whether or not a community website is for you and your particular needs, you're welcome to reach out to us and um, our support uh, folks can, can certainly provide you with answers and additional help. Um, I, we had opened up in the registration process the opportunity for questions, and so many of you posted questions uh, when, when you registered for the webinar, and we're really appreciative of that. We actually have a record of all of those questions, and so we certainly can provide some answers to you post-webinar, um, and I'm happy to stay on for a few more moments, and perhaps Sherry and Sylvia, we can, we can maybe address one of the questions on this slide, and then we can follow up with folks um, following the webinar to answer the additional ones, because I don't want to keep folks too much past the hour. So did you want to address um, either question one or two um, for the, the listeners today? Are you addressing me, um, Brooks, mainly to answer maybe the, the first question? Sure. Uh, this was a... As a caregiver uh, during the last days of his condition? Sure. That would be great, Sylvia. Thank you, because those, that's still so yesterday for me because it was just uh, July 6th of 2011. And one of my biggest struggles was even though I would never wanted to think that John was in his last days, was that every time I would leave him at the memory care center where he was staying, I would wonder, should I stay the night? Should I stay two or three hours longer or two or three minutes longer? And when he did pass away, I was at work in Los Angeles, but I have not let the guilt about that beat me down that I wasn't there because I've never been a pessimist thinking now is the time for me to stay 24-7 because he is going to leave me. So he would have wanted me to be going to work. He was always so happy that I was working and loved it. So I, that was a struggle for me inside. but. It's okay. Wow, thanks so much for sharing that. I'm sure you speak for so many in that are in a caregiving role, and I really appreciate you sharing that example of you know acknowledging the struggle and then pushing through, knowing that that's a way of honoring him and honoring the needs that you have. So thank you so much for sharing that with our audience. Um, question number three. Um, Sherry, I, I, I can't help but think of you when I read that question, and so I want to turn it over to you. How do I make time to care for myself while caring for an ill husband, three children, and working? I know one of the answers might be lots of helping hands, but I'm sure you've got some other ideas, too. <laughs> yeah, no, in fact, yeah, obviously lots of helping hands is a great solution to this because it does give you that break. It gives you that respite that you need. But I, I want to first of all just acknowledge this question by saying it is not easy. I mean, this is something that a lot of caregivers and, and just all of us in general struggle with sometimes when you're overwhelmed with things. The first thing to go is your own your own needs. You know, you give up certain things that make you happy or you know that you used to do because now you've got this new role of caregiver. So I, I would say though that here's something to think about and that is that while you are a caregiver and you you have all these new tasks and all these new responsibilities one of the responsibilities is that you have to continue to be there for your loved one you cannot become ill you cannot uh, develop your own chronic illness let's say because you're you're having prolonged stress or you're not getting enough good good nutrition or good exercise so it really is part of your responsibilities, if you will, and it will make you a better caregiver. It will help you um, to balance things. It's just it's hard to do, but I love you know the lots of helping hands is a solution because you can turn to the folks in your community, and when you need some time off, there's going to be somebody there then that can volunteer to help you out. Um, the other thing is I mentioned the me time Monday, and I love the concept of using Monday. To check in with yourself every week. It, there's science behind this, folks. If you look at that uh, Monday Campaign website, they have research from Johns Hopkins University showing that if you 
decide you're going to have this plan and you're going to do something once a week for yourself and you check in with yourself every Monday, you are actually going to be more successful at keeping that promise to yourself because Monday becomes your milestone for saying, did I do it? Okay, what do I need to do? When am I going to find that five minutes or those five hours this week? So those are my tips for caregivers. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Sherry for for sharing those they're they're really poignant and we appreciate it um, question number four we will not address right now but we promise to follow up with you suffice it to say we have thousands of um, religious groups that uh, for decades and decades and decades have been providing support uh, bringing meals to to folks in their community and we've got thousands now who are using lots of helping hands in order to organize that and we have a, a number of ideas that we can share with you through our member support center and and look forward to following up with whomever asked this question to give you more details so to wrap things up I just wanted to remind everyone on a call that um, they can definitely reach out to Sherry Snelling, the CEO of Caregiving Club, who, again, we're so grateful, Sherry, for your your wise thoughts and, and uh, for interviewing Sylvia today and for sharing your tips that were so helpful to the those of us who are in caregiving situations. So um, please follow Sherry and, and like her on Facebook and, and watch her wonderful uh, videos on YouTube as, as you continue on your caregiving journey. Uh, well, thanks, thanks. And I want to just I want to just thank Sylvia because you know all the tips are great, but bringing the stories to life like Sylvia did, I think are are terrific. And thank, yeah, thank you for thank the opportunity. So yeah, it was a pleasure, really. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And um, yes, that was uh, definitely um, a wonderful way to spend an hour um, with both of you. And I I know our audience and listeners um, got so much out of it. And Sylvia, as I think I told you at the front of the hour, all of us here at Lots of Helping Hands, uh, people were pretty um, envious that we got to, that I got to be able to meet you and, and hear your story live. And on behalf of the entire company, we really appreciate you sharing uh, your story. Um, so much for inviting me. I, I, it's my pleasure, really. Well, great. Well, with that, um, you know, again, thanks for all to uh, for their participation, um, all of you on the line. Please continue to watch for messages about our webinar series. We have one every month. We're going to be having one at the end of March, which is another guest speaker, which we'll be telling you all about soon. And thank you for participating with us, and we wish you all the best in your caregiving journey, wherever it may take you. And if we can help uh, here at Lots Helping Hands, uh, please let us know. Thanks for participating, and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.